Now these four formulas are everything that we need to fully characterize constant acceleration motion. If you're given the acceleration and the initial position and velocity. In fact, if you aren't given these quantities, you can still use these formulas to find out what you need. For instance, if you're given time and velocity change, but not acceleration, you can calculate the acceleration and then proceed normally. Or let's say you know the acceleration and you want to find what the final velocity is after traveling a particular distance, not after a particular time. You could find this by calculating the time to travel that distance and using that time to find the velocity. Or we could do that once symbolically and then find the formula to use generally. The kinematic equations we'll want to use for this derivation are the one for position as a function of time and the definition of acceleration rearranged to solve for the time now. Then substitute delta v over a for delta t where it appears in the first equation. We've just plugged it in. Now what I've done is substituted in v minus v naught for delta v. Now I expand the square term, the binomial square v minus v naught squared becomes a v squared minus 2v v naught plus v naught squared. Now we combine like terms and simplify. The 2v v naught terms, those are going to cancel. And then we have like terms in v naught squared. So we have a plus v naught squared and a minus 2v naught squared. Those aren't going to quite cancel, but they will combine and we'll simplify this equation substantially. What's left, look at that, v squared minus v naught squared. Or we can rearrange that slightly. The square of the final velocity is equal to the square of the initial velocity plus twice the acceleration times the distance traveled. You can verify that all three terms in this formula give velocity squared units, meters squared per second squared. Alternatively, another kind of situation you might find yourself in is if you know that the acceleration is constant, but instead of knowing what the value of the acceleration is, you know the time elapsed and the initial and final velocities. Of course, from that, you can directly find the acceleration. Or if we don't need the acceleration for anything, we can just use the velocities and the time to find what we're looking for. The relevant kinematic equations are the position equation and then the definition of acceleration delta V over delta T. And then I've expanded that delta V to be v minus v naught. So what I'm going to do is take this second equation, which gives us an expression for a, and I'm going to substitute that into the first equation where a shows up. x equals x naught plus v naught delta t. This one half a delta t squared term becomes substantially more complex. We're going to evaluate it and try to simplify. We have like terms now because here's another v naught delta t term. Let's combine those. We can simplify the two terms in v naught delta t, and we end up with one half v naught delta t plus one half v delta t. We can combine that slightly, factoring out the one half, and we get one half times the sum of v naught plus v delta t. Now this is interesting. One half v naught plus v is the arithmetic mean, the average, of the initial and final velocities. If the velocity is changing at a constant rate, if the acceleration is constant, this simple average is the same thing as the average velocity. And so this is saying that the average velocity times the time gives you the distance traveled. And of course that's correct. That's the definition of average velocity. So that's kind of neat. The terms on the left hand side of the equation are all in distance units because they're both distance terms. The terms on the right hand side are also in distance units because that's velocity times time. So everything works. The formula makes sense and the units work.